So why don't um, you give us a brief, give us a little shill at the beginning. So why don't you tell us who you are, uh, what you do, and where people can find you? Uh, well, I am the Everyday Progressive. My name is Joe. Mm-hmm. Um, nice for sure, because that's a long that's, that's that's a long name to say every single time. So it is. But anywho, um, I started uh, streaming, not streaming, but like doing videos, and then did some streaming like back in 2018, more or less, and been growing more serious with it. Uh, just trying to put out ideas to get go out to people if they're doesn't matter what political leanings you are. I try not to run a echo chamber. Um, now I'm just an average kind of dude and I just try to get out good ideas as I see it. Um, and I try to make them appealing to everyone as much as I can. I mean, I've had plenty of experience, uh, debating people on the, on the, uh, political, uh, right, left, up, down. Mm-hmm. Um, well, more or less the political right, especially since like 1999, I think talking in the political arena. So I know I'm, I'm younger than I look, uh, but I'm, I'm actually around 42. So, um, so I've had plenty of experience debating people online, especially the far right. So I try to bring some of that experience to the table. So if anyone out there wants to check out my YouTube channel, the everyday progressive show, and I do stream occasionally on Twitch, same name. Um, I'm trying to get more active on Twitter. I'm not trying to be trolly. Just, just trying to get, put out those great ideas I got, or at least I think they're good ideas, but, uh, um, try to keep an open mind, try to keep a good discourse where if you're conservative or right wing, um, I'll, I'll talk to you too. And I'll talk to regular old liberals and I try to bring them over to realize, Hey, this is what we're trying to do. I mean, it's not as scary. Mm-hmm. And then please don't run away from the socialist word. It's just don't do that. It's just <laughs> so, so, so defeating. It just don't, I know some people no, doing that. that. I'm like, Oh God, I don't do that. That's, that's, that's the wrong, that's, that's the wrong thing. To do. Uh, that, that's pretty much me in a nutshell, more or less. But um, I really appreciate you having me on. Of course. Because YouTube, you know, has been real, real stinkerish with political channels. And I've been doing this not too seriously. Well, I've been kind of doing like a video every single week for about a year and a half or so. But even then, my channel um, is up to about 550 wonderful subscribers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, yeah, it's just, it's just standard. Well, sorry, but yeah, that's pretty much Hello, it. Me. No, it's wonderful. Thanks for coming on. Um... And I appreciate that you come with some experience to this one. So to, to everyone who's listening, um, the topic that originally we wanted to discuss a little bit was like co-determination and kind of like its utility on moving towards like socialism. Um, in short, right? Right. Um, exactly. So why don't you give us, what's the pitch for co-determination? Like if, if you're on the elevator, you got one minute to explain to Obama why he should have done co-determination. What are you going to say? If it was Obama, I'd just cuss him out. Fuck him. <laughs> Be nice. Um, He's Obama. <laughs> <laughs> he's a sellout disappointment oh my god so let's let's I'm, say that you're I'm, being I'm, I'm to you obama <laughs> you're being nice to mr obama okay and you uh you want to explain co-determination to his sellout ass right okay okay this, this is how i do it more or less hey, hey listen obama you would you like to do something that would increase economic stability and uh help to increase productivity a little bit and help to uh you know increase worker enfranchisement or to who franchise worker rights and all that and he says um well oh, yeah it sounds like a good idea well let's let's do what germany's doing what they've been doing for the past 40 50 years with co-determination by having worker elected reps put onto the board of represent board of, of, of uh board of things board of um ceos or whatever God, what's that called i'm sure like this. the executives the board the directors yeah, yeah. it's got different names so have, all of it's fine so like they've been doing this for decades and it's been working out very well for them and because they already have this as a policy in place, we can pretty much adapt that to our situation, require that all companies over 500 employees have at least 30% elected worker represent- representatives to the board of directors. Um, so it just the workers have some say in how their workplace is ran. And guess what? They're more productive because they're happier. Happy workers are productive worker. And you know, um, it's, it's more economically stable in downturns, and that's it's a great way to introduce workplace democracy to 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 everyone across the board in America, to where they can understand it. I call it socialism with training wheels. <laughs> that's a nice phrase. So something I thought was interesting. So when I read about co determination, one of the things that's very interesting to me is um, 
So like the U.S. doesn't have co-determination, and neither do most countries. Like co-determination is actually pretty rare. It's as far as I can tell, it's only Sweden, France, um, Germany, and Denmark, pretty much. Um, and there's something that's a little bit broader, which is called sectoral bargaining. Um, and these aren't like in contrast; they're just they're usually complementary methods. Every country that has like um, co-determination also has sectoral bargaining. And so what it means is that there's these big confederations of unions which do these huge um, bargains, right, with um, the employers of the country. And so in France, for example, basically one of the reasons I bring this up is that in the United States, um, only about 7% of people in the private sector are unionized, right? So it's you know, one in 16 or whatever, one in eight. Um, and in France, it's the same thing. But France has, there, there's two metrics of unionization. One is membership, so 8% in both countries. The other is coverage. So in the United States, almost all of our unions are floor level. It's one firm has a union. So it's Amazon has a union or Amazon doesn't have a union. There's no big sectoral union for like packagers or like, I don't know, uh, tech workers, right? There's nothing like that in the United States. Um, yeah. In France and in most of the European countries, by contrast, there are these huge sectoral unions uh, which cover all of these people. So in France, the, the analogy is, um, sorry, so in America, it's 8% in unions and also about 8% what is called covered by unions under union coverage. Um, and in France, the analogy again is 8% in unions, but 98% um, covered by collective bargaining, right? Um, it's basically the same thing in Sweden, basically the same thing in most of these other countries. I think Germany is only like 70% covered because they've been rolling back some of these stuff. But um, I just wanted to mention that. I don't know if you were familiar with um, sectoral bargaining, but. Um, I'm, I've kind of heard of it. I'm not super familiar with it, but I think it seems to be more like that, that, that kind of deal would, uh, I mean, would certainly help. But the problem is, uh, us Americans, we, um, we're too cowardly. We're too beat down by the capitalist propaganda. So it uh, falls upon people like you and myself to, and many, 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 many others to try to get the word out, to try to really make these things known to the American people that, hey, this can really help things back out again. Mm -hmm. but, but somehow, you know how I, – I think of it this way, right? It's like – if we can break the back of capitalism in America, we can do it anywhere else. Kind of mm -hmm. like how in the Jim in the Jim Crow South, if they broke Jim Crow in the South and the Deep South, they can break it anywhere else. So I think if we do it here, it would really unleash the floodgates of, you know, workplace democracy. That's one of the things I thought was interesting is that um, co-determination isn't even a thing that too many um, like left liberals get too mad about. Um, Elizabeth Warren proposed a very large co-determination yeah. policy. Uh, and she's not known for being a socialist by any means. She was Republican in 2012, right? Um, right. And um, obviously it's not going to pass. Like, it's, it's too extreme for people like Joe Manchin or Tester, um, even if Dems did get the yeah. Senate. Um, human, human decency is too extreme for them. Basically, yes. Um, but my point was just it's, it's not something that a lot of liberals and, and social democrats actually have that much opposition to. So I think I quite like your idea of um, socialism with training wheels. It's like the first step towards kind of getting people used to it, hopefully. Well, as a matter of fact, the uh, recent video I put out on my YouTube channel uh, is entitled that, Socialism with Twitting Wheels, and in parentheses it says co-determination. But mm -hmm. um, subscribe to me on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I do want to congratulate you on the 24,000 subscribers you just got. Thanks. That's, that's nice. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to see that the lefty um, spheres are growing, and it's amazing in that so many or so many of these channels are starting to pick up in their mm -hmm. in their numbers. I mean, Vosh, my God, he, I mean, I mean, that's as, been uh, incredible. As still, as, as long as you're still cool with him, I mean, I don't know what's going on because there's a lot. Of, there's always a lot of stuff oh, going on, so I don't know what's going on. But if you are, it's like it's amazing because he's oh, he just broke three hundred thousand, which is incredible. Um, I mean, there are, I mean, it's like no one agrees with everyone one hundred percent. I'm saying it just it's just it's just great to finally see all these lefty channels finally start to take off and really begin to have some real force behind what they're trying to get out. It's, just, it's more than just, um, I think we should do more than just criticize, 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 which is, is important. Still do that, but try to imply like policy positions, real world policy positions to what we're trying to put out there instead of just being a bunch of uh, quote unquote, you know, whiners, which I, I'm, a, no, I'm, I mean, a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a professional whiner. But, you know. No, I mean, that's actually something, um, if I have to raise one critique of the left, um, yeah, you know, which I, I suppose is the, the favorite pastime of the left, um, is that most writings on the left, by the left, are critiques of capitalism, but not proposals for what to do as an alternative, right? Like, there's this big critique that in Marx, he spends, you know, like 4,000, 5,000 pages hating on capitalism, hating on competition, hating on all this. 
and he spends you know maybe five pages writing about what the alternative is um same thing occurs in virtually every leftist writer and so i, I really quite like actually people like matt brunig and um I don't know if you're there, there's some people more from like uh, from France, like Gabriel Zuckman and Piketty, who do propose these sort of alternate systems. They aren't necessarily even socialist. Piketty, I think, is just a left liberal um, or possibly a non Marxian socialist, but he proposes alternatives. He's like, hey, here are concrete policies that we can do to get closer to our goal instead of being like, hey, capitalism is just bad and just like talking about it over and over and over again. Um, so I, that's why I really like talking about co determination and other socialist policies. Yeah, I mean, and again, I think it's a great way to introduce the idea because if you ask most people on the street, hey, would you like to hear more? Or do you know what workplace democracy is? They're going to look at you like, who? Huh? Mm -hmm. Workplace what? I get the vote. So, and so I figure this is a great way as long as we can somehow get the message out there because you think Rupert Murdoch's really going to let us go on to his network and disseminate, you know, or tell us, yeah, no, 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 he ain't going to let that happen. Um, well, he probably won't. Or if he does, he'll do it in such a way that well, it tries well, to. He does, but when he does it, it's Tucker Carlson, right? It's like, guess who's destroying your workplace democracy? It's the immigrants. Like it's it's always like the the populist rhetoric where they don't actually believe what they say. It's just another excuse to hate on like the other. God, another neo, another little. Why don't we proto fascist in a nice little suit? I tell you, basically. Um, he, he's, 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 he's just the worst because he kind of acts like he kind of wants to get on board with some of his ideas, but then he twists it and perverts it into some some weird angle. Like, dude, you don't don't need to do that, but he does it because he's a he's a dillweed. I mean, I but, think um, that the the basic idea for why they do it. This is like why fascists for time immemorial have adopted like some leftist rhetoric is that it can take. Uh, the quote-unquote populist like rage or whatever that might have gone to bernie sanders and now it can be directed towards people like donald trump who will not enact leftist policy so like rupert murdoch who is by no means like an economic leftist is totally fine with using a little bit of leftist signaling so as long as it doesn't lead to any actual yeah. leftist policy yeah because as long as he's in control of the mic because let's say if someone like myself goes on there and makes a good case for it well guess what they, they still have the mic but they have it for weeks and weeks and months to do to do damage control and to spin, yeah. spin, spin, and to, to get to get their audience put back in the line of what their what their status quo. But I, but I think if we yeah sorry finish. No, no, that was that was pretty much it. All I was good. I was just going to pivot back towards the um, co-determination stuff. So if you wanted to finish up this, that's totally fine. Yeah, but um, no, this is the only thing I was going. Only thing I was going to add to that was, but yeah, if we just 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 please just keep on getting the message out there and try to get people to do a call to action. Um, I try to remember, remember to do that in my videos to where people like, um, you know, just, just have some sense of which direction to go into. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I think that, I think that that's also, that's also really important, but yeah, the co-determination issue I think really is, I mean, Richard Wolf talked about it in one of his videos a year or two ago and he, he, he didn't like the idea because he doesn't, he didn't think it went far enough, but people got to realize that us left, us lefties who talk online or who are really <laughs> deep in the weeds, you know, we, 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 we know this shit, but, but the vast majority of the American people don't. And if you ask them about that, I mean, hell, I didn't even know about co-ops until about maybe a year and a half ago. And I'm mm -hmm. pretty much been left wing, left wingish all my life, pretty much or all my adult life. And so as soon as I found out, wait, wait a minute, why does this way to, Oh shit! You know, the way to really balance out the the concentrated mm -hmm. power that's in the hands of the real to few, because I see that as a big problem. That I think a lot of these theories seem to dance around. But I don't know if they address it directly. Is that I came up? See, I see as a libertarian socialist, more or, mm -hmm. or less, that's what I am. Um, I came up with this description of what libertarian socialism seems to make sense the most, and it's basically a libertarian socialist is someone who advocates for the greatest amount of personal liberties and freedoms while ensuring there are mechanisms in place to keep power from concentrating into the hands of a relative few politically or economically. And I think that a lot of problems mm -hmm. throughout history revolves around too much power being put into hands of too few people relatively and then having that power exerted over everyone else, either politically, economically, religiously, whatever. And I try to see about you know, what, what ways can we balance that to where it's not as extreme it's never going to be perfect but is, what, what, what things can we do and what real world policies are in place right now to where we can actually implement those things or ideas to, to really begin to really smooth out that you know economically forget yeah. about it the basal i mean this, this is really 
No, I mean, to, yeah. th there's this Michael Brooks quote, um, which I quite like, which is that a lot of like succeeding in, in struggles like this is, um, so his quote is, uh, to play the game of chess, like they have more pieces, we need to take their, their pieces off the board. It's about eliminating sources of power um, for capitalists. And so like part of it is that by and large, like people who have enormous amounts of wealth control media, they control the production of culture, they control disproportionate you. amounts of politics. Um, though in none of these is, I, I think some people, um, especially people who are like Marxists, like to say it's dictatorship of the bourgeois, as if it's like this binary you. thing. Only they have power and like there is no democracy, which I don't think is the case. I think that there's a lot of evidence that voting does matter. Even Democrats versus Republicans do matter. There's a difference between yeah. like a liberal and a conservative. There's a difference between like a left liberal and a national conservative like Trump. Um, all that aside, um, I, I do very much agree with like focusing on change in the short term. One of the things that I really liked about Bernie Sanders, just having a large platform, is that he was able to normalize a lot of these ideas. So I think a lot of people actually heard about co-determination from Elizabeth Warren. I think a lot of people heard about like $15 minimum wage and Medicare for all from, from Bernie Sanders. Green New Deal was AOC. Um, there's this kind of role that people can have in boosting policy, uh, which I think is enormously useful for the left. Um, so I like totally 100% agree. Um, it does frustrate me sometimes that you get people on the left who are kind of purists. They're like, if we don't get worker cooperatives 100% tomorrow, it's not real socialism. Um, because yeah. the, the point to me is like, we aren't going to get there in one step. The question is, how do we accumulate power in such a way that we can get there as quickly as possible? If you do worker determinate co-determination, that means unions are more powerful. More powerful unions means more Democrats. More Democrats means more powerful unions sort of thing. That's the sort of, sort of idea. Um, so because because people have to know about these ideas before they can support them you know what i mean yes they've got to know about them and support them and so there's this big problem also of like propaganda right if if we don't have any unions putting out messages there if it's only like this big meat centralized media um then to some degree we're at a huge disadvantage um like unions are basically dead like the the analogy in the united states is that not the analogy the graph in the united states is that 40 percent of the private sector was um unionized in like the 1940s today it's seven percent uh, most of those are in like very small sectors uh, not sorry not very small sectors they're in like particular sectors and other sectors are basically de-unionized um i wish all unions were as strong as the police union <laughs> yes that was that's kind of like a backhanded strong. compliment but yes <laughs> unfortunately they're as strong as shit but well, um i guess the to pivot towards um the co-determination thing again i posted this graph it's from the Econ for in, um, Inclusion and Prosperity article, which is by Zuckman, I think. Yeah. No, it's by Doob. Doob is great, too. Um, and all it shows is the, it's the graph of membership and coverage in like the OECD countries. And so you can see, that, like what I was trying to say with France, very low membership, very high coverage due to this sort of sectoral bargaining. Um, all I was gonna, basically all I was trying to suggest is that um, a lot of people who've written about this suggest that there's a, a really good, um, what do you call it, like synergy between um, sectoral unions, sectoral bargaining, and um, co-determination. Uh, if you don't have, if you have co-determination, but like shop level unions, um, unions could still remain very, very weak because they would basically be tied to membership, like they are in Japan, the United States, and most of the English speaking countries. Um, but if you have this sort of sectoral bargaining, then co-determination becomes something that everywhere now has like a, this big, strong union, and they have workers in control of the board. Um, that was the basic suggestion that I was trying to raise there. Yeah, it, it, just, it seems to make sense because if you have sec 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 sectoral unions and bargaining, it seems to provide that much more of a robust backbone to the whole process instead of leaving it so fractured that, hey, divided we fall versus if we're all really united yeah. in a much more meaningful way then we can actually stand up to these uh force monumental forces that the ownership class put on the uh process to try to claw back those rights and just to make a little bit extra money mm -hmm. um and it's like that, yeah that definitely makes sorry. sense i was actually gonna so to mention that a little bit one of the the reasons that unions are hated more in so uh, back up one step um there's kind of like four main quote-unquote economic models this isn't entirely accurate but um, you have something like the English-speaking countries and the Asian countries, which is Japan, the United States, like all in the English-speaking countries like Britain, and they tend to have these shop-level unions. You've got the continental countries like France and Germany and so on, and they generally have sectoral bargaining but sm low membership rates. And you've got the Nordic countries, which have high membership and high um, like coverage. 
Um, so basically, in short, the, the American model is low coverage and low membership. The Continental model is low membership, high coverage, and then the Nordic model is high membership and high coverage. And that one seems to be the strongest. Um, there's this really neat paper, I can go find it, which showed that that model was the most resistant. Every country in the world has seen a decline in unionization, every country. Um, but those countries have been the most resistant to the, the like 1980s neoliberal movement um, out there, for unionization anyway. So I thought that was very interesting. I totally agree with what you're saying, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I'm just so smart. I got high level ideas that people, you know, just you know, disagree because my IQ's my IQ's one million. Um, actually, I took one of those online tests uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was one of the legit ones that you didn't have to pay for, but it actually put my <laughs> it actually put my IQ within a range like between. I flubbed a couple of the questions, so that's why I got. It could have been better, but anyway, it put my IQ between ninety one and one hundred and ten. So <laughs> I'm very good average. Enough. Look, average is good average. enough, okay? The average man will be the... Nothing is too good for the average man. Nothing is too the good average will world. inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, don't, so people out there so people out there watching this thing and, oh, this girl's got IQ of 200. Please don't think that. I'm just an average jag off nobody just trying to put out some good ideas wherever I see it on my little corner of the internet. I posted the study. I, you don't need to obviously like read it, this, this chat. I just thought it was very interesting and that it suggests exactly what you were saying. And the, the fourth type of uh, economy that they pointed to into this article was the ex-dictatorships of Spain, Greece, and Portugal. <laughs> so, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, because it's hard to remember sometimes that there used to be literal fascist dictatorships in Spain, Greece, and Portugal <laughs> um, until pretty recently. But whatever. Yeah. They put the dick in dictatorships because a bunch of dicks. But, um, yeah, it's... It's real interesting. It's it's just really strange to see like um, so many of these ideas that work out in other countries that can easily easily be brought to America, and it is weird that um, it's not weird actually. It's it's systematic propaganda that's keeping mm -hmm. such ideas from coming to America. But it's just so they're just so rel relatively speaking, they're so simple, um, and it's just that the ownership class is just basically turned the United States into a a bank that looks like a country. Um, and it's, it's it's really sad. So I'm just doing whatever I can to try to get the word out about this. Say, hey, look, this is going to be a great stepping stone. Do I want to stop at co-determination? No, of course not. I want I would like to see uh, public banking be instituted to where worker mm -hmm. cooperatives could have an easier time to get funding to get started. To where have they have that backbone because private companies, private businesses have private banking to back them up as mm -hmm. a, as a, as a financial support. So I'm not saying that these public banks are being going to be a a uh, charity giveaway, but it's going to give these cooperatives an easier time to get the funds to get started with their own enterprises to begin to sh truly shift. Because even Marx said that all this is going to be transitory, mm -hmm. but because he said it's going to be trans transitory, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to take 500 years to do. Uh, you can, you know, it's well, like climbing a ladder. You can, you can you can climb a ladder very quickly, or you can do it very slowly. It's all about how fast you want to step on those steps. But um, that this this is this is a matter of getting people on board, getting them to know about workplace democracy. Hey, look, it works in Germany and these other places. Let's bring in here. And then they then then all of a sudden they can open their minds to other possibility mm -hmm. possibilities down the road. That's what's really important to me. I mean, the way that I always I don't have a good analogy for it, but the way that I always think about it is like um, is positive feedback loops. Like in in most other countries in the world. Um, unionization wasn't suppressed nearly so strongly in the 50s period, um, except basically in the dictatorships. Um, but in, in like most of the rest of the world, like Canada and most of the other economies, um, there was a longer period of unions cooperating with the political process. Um, and as a result, the social democratic parties were much stronger. And so there was this, this virtuous cycle where unions were strong, so the social democratic parties were strong, so they ensured legislation to keep the unions strong, and so on and so on. Um, and so I think of it almost as like an acceleratory process. You know, usually when we talk about accelerationism, it's like we want to do, we want to like screw over yeah. the poor so that they'll rise up in a revolution or something. But this is like reformist accelerationism. It's like um, you want to give yeah, the workers just... more power so they get more power, so they take more power, so they get more power, sort of thing. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a self reinforcing type of situation. Instead of spiraling down, you're sort of spiraling up. Yeah, but um. Now, now, some might try to argue that, well, if we do what Germany's doing and force these big companies, and it'll, 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 only, it'll only apply to big companies or medium-sized companies and larger, because I think the power – I mean, think of it this way. Like, 
with a small mom and pop pizza shop, you pretty much know the owner. You can build or have a better chance of building a rapport with that owner who owns that business privately. And you can maybe, you know, you know, be looked upon as a family member over time. Maybe, maybe. But so there, there, that's, that's one thing, which I think should be eventually be replaced by true worker cooperatives. But um, when it comes to, say, a larger business like, say, Amazon, do you think you're mm-hmm. ever going to see Bezos unless he's some on a distant podium somewhere? Mm-hmm. No, you ain't going to build any, any sort of rapport for him. So there has to be that that mechanism in place to make sure that he can't, he and his uh, shareholders and his board of directors, his private board of directors, can't use their position to try to keep the wages suppressed, keep worker rights suppressed, just to maximize their bonuses and shit like that. Um, so I think yeah. it would, doing co-determination is not providing an unjust force, but is providing a proper counterforce to the amount of huge amount of economic and quite frankly, political power that these uh, large companies have that, you know, thanks to Citizens United, they can, you know, good money is speech, but you can't arrest corporate. Yeah, corporations mm-hmm. are people, but you can't, you can't arrest them. All right. For, it's, 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 no, no. But it's just think of it as counterforce. So if someone says, comes across you, say, hey, it's unjustified. You can't meet these large companies. Well, they did it all themselves. Like, no, they didn't do it all themselves. And mm-hmm. two, they have so much power. That shit should be kept in check. So, so I know that's, that. So that's one of my, one of my, one of my, I'm sorry, last thing. Mm-hmm. No worries. That's, 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 that's also one of my other philosophies is about trying to provide some sort of balance or counterbalance towards those extremes of those who hold unilateral power or pretty much it that's that's also what i try to get at no i was going to mention is um one of the interesting features of the german co-determination system is that it increases with company scale it only has two stages um so you know that we have like progressive taxation basically they have progressive co-determination um, and I quite like that idea. Uh, I think that yeah. I think that the numbers are: if your firm is over 500 employees, then a third has to be workers, and if it's over, I want to say 5,000, then it has to be half workers. Um, and so, to me, this seems like a very easily extensible concept. You're just thinking thinking of it in terms of tax brackets. You increase it, you increase the rate, the proportion at which workers have control of the board with a certain size. Um, that's a direct way to give workers more control. It also reminded me: um, have you ever heard of the Meidner plan? Ooh, no, I haven't. No worries. Um, <laughs> let me go get a link to that. It's like Vasa Das. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's Swedish, so almost. Um, I do speak a little bit of German. I can't do it fluently, but I do this little, this little uh, jokes like, um, "Hey Joe, you speak German, right?" And he's like, "Yeah." He says, "Hey Joe, say something in in German," and that's when I'll say "Etwas in Deutsch." Yeah. <laughs> um, you know. Um. Sorry, I was just getting the paper. <laughs> the Jacobin Meidner. This one just has like a very simple um, description of the plan. Um, the basic idea, and it was never enacted. Um, so brief historical note. One of the things that happened to social democracy around the world, one of the reasons we saw the rise of neoliberalism is basically that there was this huge inflation crisis due to the oil crisis in the 1970s. And it crushed most of the economies of the world. Um, and it crushed most of the social democrats that were in charge. Um, so in virtually every country on earth, the social democrats and like the left liberals kind of fell back and they, everyone moved like one step to the right. And the USSR literally collapsed you know, a few decades after that. Um, so there was this enormous worldwide shift to the right um, in the 70s and 80s. And a huge part of it just comes from the oil crisis. So why did they all fail at the same time? Basically inflation. Um, so one of my like side notes is socialists shouldn't just print money, okay? That's a bad policy. Stop printing money. Um, <laughs> If you want to look at why Venezuela is failing, it's not necessarily because of any of their particular policies, but because they're at 1 million percent inflation, um, which is a lot. Um, well, I mean, also because the uh, embargoes, USA, uh, and... Uh, none of those help. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, just saying, like, all of, those, <laughs> all of those would have certainly, cr- like, hurt the economy, but the inflation, that's what's actually crushing it. I, I totally yeah, agree I that there's, the U.S. is by no means, like, innocent in, like, the, the demise of, the, of Venezuela. Um, yeah, I know you're not leaving that out, but some people might go, oh, wait a minute, this is like this inflation can't do that, can't do your, your UBI, even though we can, and we're actually doing the more expensive, less effective thing right now with letting poverty exist the way it does, and the way I figured it, I, we can talk about this some other time, but mm-hmm. we're doing the more expensive, less effective thing right now, and we're sandbagging our own, own economic growth, not giving every adult citizen a thousand bucks a month. 
that's the way I do it. But anyway, that's my TED talk on that real quick. No, I mean, um, I agree. So the Meidner plan, and this one's just interesting to me because it's the, it, 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 it feels to me like the same sort of progressive amping up of worker control that you can get with a co-determination or sectoral bargaining sort of policy. Um, the basic premise was that um, there's kind of two ways of going around something like this, but the way that they wanted to do it was directly transferring um, let's say that each year you directly transfer 1% of shares of every firm, let's say over 500 employees, to the union for that firm. And let's say that you mandate that every firm over 500 employees has to have a union. Then, de facto, over time, after 50 years, the unions in the country will necessarily own 50% of the capital in the country, or at least the big firms anyway. Um, and so it represents this sort of like gradual amping up of worker power. And one of the benefits of this sort of thing is that... Um, because it's so gradual, there are weaker incentives for capitalists just to be like, ah, no, I'm losing 1% of my shares. I'm going to flee the country. I'm going to like start a coup. I'm just going to coup to a revolt. It's basically equivalent to something thinking about like a 1% tax increase. Some people will leave, but it's very, very few. And so instead of having like a large sh sudden shock, it's sort of like gradually easing people in. So you, people often use this analogy to like critique socialist policies, especially libertarians. They'll say that um, you're familiar with the analogy of uh, slowly boiling a frog alive, right? This is literally, yeah. I think this is literally boiling a frog alive slowly, but like in a good way. It's th this way we don't lead to a sudden capital Mus flight. Strange, strangely, Mussolini had a pretty good analogy too. It was uh, nobody notices when you pluck a chicken one feather at a time. You yeah. know, it's creepy, you know, creepy fuck. But <laughs> of course it's saying. Mussolini saying in a weird way. But yes. That dude had a ghoul, that dude had a ghoulish eyes I've, I've ever seen to anybody. I don't know. He's like, I... but anyway, um, I want to show y'all out there that I know history a little bit. <laughs> I'm not oh, you got no points to prove. Runs. You're you're fine. No, I just, I just really like this policy. I was just, I I really like code determination. I was mostly just interested in like looking at kind of I think it's a good policy. The question is what can we do to like strengthen code determination and strengthen worker rights that are like either um that either synergize that either work together with like code determination or that are, are alternatives to it. So most of these to me seem like synergize. I, I hate to use synergize because it's like a business term, but um like collaborate, work with, strengthen code determination. It means things work together very well. Yeah, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, of course, it all seems to make sense. Like when you look at all these ideas, and you look at them from like a dispassionate point of view, and you see what they can do, you kind of ask yourself, why the hell haven't we implemented these sooner? But of course, the answer is obvious: capitalist propaganda, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the news media t telling, uh, or the, 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 the capitalist news owners telling the media or their disseminators, "Hey, don't say this, don't say that, don't say this." Or don't talk about this, don't talk about that. But the average person is going to ask himself, why the hell? These are good ideas. Why the hell can't we? Yeah, I mean, let's just do it. So I think that, that's going to be the tipping point, too, is like when most people know about these ideas, like Medicare for All, or more and more people know more about UBI, they say, you know, let's just, let's just do it. Um, it seems to make sense, so let's just get the right people elected so we get these policies enacted. Wake up, liberal. I love you. No, I mean... There's this great quote from Lenin of all places where he talks about the, the uh, I, and I don't like Lenin by any means, um, <laughs> this quote from Lenin where he says something to the lions of like, hey, when we get into parliament, um, it gives us this enormous power to um, promote our ideas, to unify um, like workers' movements. Because one of the things that's very interesting, um, there, there's this theory called the Gravedigger Thesis, which asserts that um, as, I, I, know it's, I know it's complicated, but... Um, not, sorry, not that it's complicated. That's another, yet another term that I'm adding to this conversation. Um, oh, is that oh. over time, capitalism requires more and more educated workers. It requires more and more centralization of power. It requires more and more managers. And so this this idea that as workers get more and more educated and more and more involved in these complicated forms of production, they get more and more power and more and more ability to organize. And so like one of the things that was really interesting is that while there were workers' movements prior to, say, like the 1800s, um, prior to compulsory and in education, most of them didn't have very concrete aims. It was stuff like the Luddites or the Levelers, which had some concrete aims, but it wasn't like a movement in the way that we think about socialism today, where they had like concrete political goals and a, a means to like achieve them. And so as people got more and more educated, now they can like actually work towards these goals. And I, I think I wanted to relate this to your point somehow, but I totally forgot. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, the grave digger, that, that kind of sounds like, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe it's a different angle, but like if, if the population gets so educated, they want to do maybe they want to do all the the higher skill jobs and that doesn't lead that many people to do the grave digging. Is that maybe it? 
No, it's so the reason it's called the Gravedigger thesis. Sorry, I should have explained that. Is it's this idea? You have you know the the um, I think it's the Stalin quote, which is like the last capitalist will sell us the rope that we ha use to hang them with, or something. Or that's Molotov. Yeah. It's it's an analogy to that. It's that the capitalists are the grave diggers of capitalism is the theory because they keep educating workers, they keep centralizing workers, they keep giving workers more power. Um, so I the reason I, I oh, like that my, man, okay yeah yeah okay yeah 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 you know what let's just, let's just keep on doing it and uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, 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 I'm seriously I mean, people talk about like this this guillotine talk and stuff I think that's a bit cringe honestly no uh, I don't me, I'm I'm huge I'm huge I'm a huge uh, opponent to the death penalty. Yeah. Um, yeah, because because it disproportionately affects minority groups, ethnically minority groups, or minority groups in general. Yeah. And um, unless they're super rich and they can buy politicians again, but uh, um, yeah, so yeah, that and it turns out four to five percent people who actually get put on death row are actually innocent. So I figured, you know what, just let them rot in jail because more than likely we can save a bunch of money having them have go through the appeals process because if you're going to be killed by a state, no, you I... have lots of appeal pro appeals processes. So more often than not, you can save money. Just let them rot in jail. If they really did a hands crab, give them, give them like five life sentences. They're never getting out. If they really did something that horrible, let them let them sit there and just 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 think about what they did. And if and if and if, if, if it's like, well, I think Charles Manson was one of them. Oh, I like being mm -hmm. here. Just let him stay there. Just keep him away from people. Well, no, I mean, the, um, I, I totally agree with that, right? I'm like, I'm a very much a reformist. I don't think that we should, I, ideally, I would like any political change to come with zero deaths involved, zero violence involved. Um, you know, the, the less harm, the better. Um, and on the death penalty, I totally agree. Often the way that I phrase it is that the, the death penalty is essentially, I'm sorry, the, the life penalty is essentially a very delayed death penalty because they're going to die eventually, right? Um, it's just that you aren't going through the process of trying to kill them actively with all the associated legal costs and possibility of getting it wrong. Because um, you can always stop the life penalty, but once you've done the death penalty, right. it's done. You can't undo it. So, totally agree. Yeah, it's just a lot of these, um, you know, I guess a lot of people, at first I was on the fence about it way a while back, but then the more I looked into it, the more I said, you know what, we just gotta, it's barber, it's barber, uh, mm -hmm. barbaric, and uh, quite yeah. frankly, it's just and people who are innocent get killed anyway. Like, why? Why do that? I mean, this is just because you want to feel mod. They want to feel macho, or oh yeah, we. I'm judge, hang them high, and they're all guilty. You're in front of me, you're guilty. No, I mean it's. But, um, it, I, I'm sure you've heard like re rehabilitation versus retribution. It's just because like there, there's this primal sense like I just want to punish people who did wrong. I want to retribute do retributive justice. Um, they are criminal, right? We're gonna like beat them up. We're gonna cause harm to them, which isn't actually how you build like a better society. The goal is ultimately either to, if there's individuals that you can't reform, you keep them away from society so they can harm nobody but themselves. And if there are individuals that you can reform, who can then come back and improve society, can participate in society, you want to do so. Um, like it, it's, it's, it's this kind of idea of like a sort of primal revenge rather than like societal improvement um, or rehabilitation, right? So, totally agree. I mean, I see it in a much grander scheme of things. I see it more like a way to... Um... As as a, as a way for the as a to protect the survival of the species, <laughs> it, we we invest in in ourselves because as far as we know, unless you believe that Galactic Federation stuff, which maybe I don't know, because um, you heard you like heard about the, that. The, the Israeli <laughs> guy said that there's like aliens out there, but they've only talked to the United States and Israel. <laughs> Right, it's like I like here's the thing. I believe that there is intelligent life out there, and that it's somewhat close by. But the thing is, I hate to say it, we're we're kind of the backwater boonies, and the aliens really don't want to get their rims stolen or the technology. Um, and by by coming here, so there's like, yeah, we're gonna go take a long way around that little. Uh, um, but I mean, maybe one day they'll somebody be ballsy and they'll say, hey, we're here, and then we can send them a message, hey, is your spaceship running? And they say, yes, well, you better go, go get it. And then they blow us up because we tell them bad jokes. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, I get it. <laughs> Who would want to hang out with us, right, while we're, like, while we can't handle yeah, a we, pandemic, we, we, while we're letting, like, half the population get... starve? Like, yeah, no, I get it. And we can't, ha well, a lot of us can't handle the fact that some people have skin tone that's a little bit darker than their own. Yeah. I mean, versus some... Um, I mean, I'm down for meeting E.T. I mean, hey, what's up? Be like in that one movie of uh, the alien ain't Paul. He likes to smoke and have a good time. I mean, 
I feel that the aliens might be more like that. I have a feeling they might be you know, more like that. E.T. is actually, in one of my econ classes, E.T. is used as an example of the extreme power of marketing. Um, you know how E.T. eats Reese's Pieces somewhere in the movie? They increased sales of Reese's Pieces 800% after that movie was released. It's like an incredible increase. <laughs> E.T. shops at Walmart, so yeah. should you. No, it's incredible. <laughs> People don't realize how easily it is to, like, manipulate. I don't know. That's that's one of the things I think is, uh, I don't know. This is the whole reason uh, why I think, like, democratic media control is actually one of the most important things. Uh, so it's extremely worrying, actually, that media is so concentrated and that generally it's concentrated among, like, very large corporations and not people like, I don't know, Democracy Now! or something. So. Well, it just shows you that if people are just exposed to these ideas and they're presented to them in a decent light they'll, they'll take to them it's just a matter of getting that message out there and that's why i do the channel that i do mm -hmm. and to try to get some of these ideas out there and you know maybe maybe one day it'll be enough to where i mean i'm not trying to you know be the sole person to sway the conversation but just another where we can get i can get the idea out there people start talking about it uh if they agree with it disagree with whatever but it just gets out there i want to be, be more like that instead of trying to be like uh you know some some cult of personality i think cult of personality is uh is really is a really really tricky 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 thing to to have and i don't really want that to tell people like hey i know it's not, i know it's hard but don't worship me <laughs> um you know, yeah my, i my, 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 thing, my pretty right? like, well, my, my dashing my, uh, good looks huh. all um, of my many pay pigs right they're just so dedicated to me i need to tell them to back off but um but no hey look but don't touch their body okay uh, you know, that whole thing, but yeah, just that's, that's, all, that's all I basically want to do. Some some of these ideas, I think that they should have been really, really been um, put out there a long time ago. But mm -hmm. you know what? Instead of worrying about the past, let's try working on the future and just trying to get that out there. And you know, as always, man, I appreciate you having me on and you know being on your platform to get these ideas out there and tell people sure. about my my little my little meager attempts of uh, trying to change the discourse for the better because i try not to run an echo chamber and you know someone comes on at a libertarian or even if they're ancast oh i love ancast oh, they're so love ancast fucking. are I, very I, thought i will totally agree with that that's thing is it's like i love fucking with them like hey you're an ancast hey hello fellow status how you doing and i'm not a status yes you are you effectively want a bunch of private states or companies running the show not private government or pro or a public government and they're like yeah. wait a minute uh, then they also know actually had one say 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 to me like well actually about uh yeah, okay, but I don't see that as a bad thing. Like, <laughs> like Basically. Love fucking with it. It's so, so good. Um, up, but, uh, the whole taxes, it's that thing. That's, that's hilarious, too. Love fucking with them with that. But, um, but yeah, it's it's just a matter of... Because, um, like, uh, again, also I want to cl clarify, if mm -hmm. anybody's confused, it's on the idea that co-determination... Co Mm -hmm. is a halfway point it says a halfway point between co-ops and traditional businesses a co-determination enterprise the workers don't own um the workers don't own that enterprise but mm -hmm. they have some control now sometimes control is better than ownership because because like in real estate i dabble with real estate a little bit um you can have control over a property like you can buy it on a lease um like a lease to op, lease to purchase or you can buy a land contract to where you don't own the property, but you have control and you're allowed to sublease to to, to your buyer or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but by the way, I just want to let you know, even though I dabble with real estate, I, I only do it with buying and selling. I don't, don't do landlording. Um, <laughs> and, here, and let's say if I came across a situation pure, where I took folks, over. He's pure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I, try to be, I try not to be a total leech. But I try to put people in a position where I've only done a little bit because I'm dabbling in it, but put them into a position where they're going to end up owning the house. They're not just going to give me money forever. Okay. I, I try to see it that way. I make a little bit in the middle and then, you know, they, they end up owning the house. But anyway, like this concept in real estate where you have control and ownership. And sometimes that's preferable. Sometimes. So I figure. Control, if you want to, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Say so if control that ownership or, Hey, you let, let the owners have a good deal of the risk. So they make their money, but you have some control over the process. And that makes things more stable and more, uh, more, a bit more productive. A happy worker is a more productive worker. I mean, that's and... one of the reasons that I wanted to bring up, because um, I, I quite like co-determination. I just wanted to bring up um, the Meidner plan and sectoral bargaining, um, because sectoral bargaining is another way you extend control. So co-determination, sectoral bargaining are all about control. Um, but then the Meidner plan is about ownership. It's that like somehow we've got to like transfer ownership from like private firms basically to unions. And the hope is that in the long run, 
Um, there's a related idea called the right of last refusal, I'm pretty sure, um, or right of first refusal. I don't actually remember the name, which is where if, it, if a firm is going to sell, then they have to give the first option to purchase the firm to the employees of said firm. They have to give employees the option to basically create a cooperative instead of just selling it, say, to a bigger firm. Um, and so there's all, there's like a lot of these policies which are intended to make it easier to get worker ownership in addition to just worker control. Um, and I guess the, the final concept I would throw out there, which is a little bit interesting, and which isn't about giving unions control, but which is about like giving public control, is called the Social Wealth Fund. Um, Alaska has a little Social Wealth Fund, and it's called their Permanent Fund, and Norway has like the famous one. It's their big Norwegian Social Wealth Fund. Um, and so those are ways for the public as the whole to own wealth and basically to transfer it away from private hands into the public collective hands. Um, so I, I was just, I, that's kind of why I was bringing these things up. I think that it, um, one can strengthen control and the other can kind of secure control even if the legislation goes back because then now the unions have control of the workplaces. Now the state has ownership of these assets. It has kind of um, ownership which can lead to control even if the control legislation gets weakened. That's all. Yeah, no, it sounds... Yeah, it sounds like a great way to reinforce each other's, um, you know, the policies and that are in place to keep them less likely from collapsing if inflation does happen again. So the neoliberals and the banksters try to set up the situation economically worldwide to position themselves. Hey, look, they can't do all these nice things, so we gotta go back to, you know, right wing libertarian austerity mm -hmm. policy or economics. Like, no, we ain't doing that. We've done that before. We ain't doing that again. Um, well, that so was one of the big. That was the big. One of the big ironies is that um, in most countries around the world, uh, the the social democratic wave until the seventies was crushed by the collapse of Keynesianism and in huge inflation after the oil crisis. And these the 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 right wing governments came into power, promising to fix it. And in most cases, they couldn't fix it because the cause of the inflation wasn't due to social democracy. It was due to the oil crisis. It was due to something underlying the the fundamental issue. And so they couldn't deliver on these promises any more than the Social Democrats could have done. It was basically just the crap situation that the voters blamed on the incumbent powers rather than on, uh, like, basically, like, foreign policy. So, Yeah, I think, I think it sounds like a case of they act like they want, they acted like they want to fix it, but they really didn't want to. And they just, you know, found, found that to be a convenient excuse to implement their uh, rather horrendous uh, neoliberal policy policies. But, um, yeah, but, yeah, like... Um, I guess this is the part where you're going to wrap it up, or I don't know oh, how sure. your plan is. Uh, yeah, no, this is about like a reasonable length if you'd like. Um, sure, so on that note, why don't you give us your closing spiel for code determination again, and then I'll make sure you do a uh, second um, shill for your channel uh, at the end of that. So why don't you give us the code determination spiel first? Well, uh, I see code determination as a way to balance out the concentrated levels of economic and political power of the ownership class in a way that um that that real that that really smooths everything out. I mean, I know I'm saying the same thing over. But I think that that's 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 a lot of the um problems that I see that's going on is too much power being handed into so much concentrated power handed into the hands of a relative few. Uh code determination would be a great first step to getting us towards a more democratized workplace, getting the idea into people's heads to where then they can see the other possibilities down the road. Uh, with public banking and co true cooperative economy, then other possibilities from there. So once certain material conditions are met for other possibilities, that's that's what they it just it's just a, a st an important stepping stone. And we have an example we can point to in Germany and other, other Germany and other places in Europe that works for very real well for them for decades. Mm -hmm. So with that, we we can bring that here, and um, the sooner the sooner the better. And it's, we've got to tell people about it and get them on board with it. So hopefully, some people in the in your in your audience, uh, whoever whoever's watching this, or whoever does watch this, um, you just go out and tell tell ten people about it. Just ten people in random live. You know, doesn't gotta be today, but just and hopefully they they tell ten people. And the next thing you know, it just, just sweeps across country like uh, Medicare for All did and UBI is doing right now. And um, no, one of the things that I are. thought has been really interesting is in the past election, um, left wing policy routinely ran ahead of the Democrats. Um, a lot of left-wing policy is more popular than the Democrats due to a variety of like partisan reasons um, and like personality reasons and so on, right? We don't need to get into too much, but like in Florida, for example, Biden lost by three points, but minimum wage won by 15 points. Um, a lot of left-wing policy is more popular than the party, which often tends to represent those policies. Um, so no, like I totally agree with this. I think that 
uh, like I said, Bernie Sanders enormously popularized this message. I think that um, talking about socialism in terms of worker democracy is a very good way to like sell people on the idea because it really relates to the ideas they like, which is control. People like control over their lives and like democracy. <laughs> they also just like democracy in general. So I totally 100% sign on with that. And with that, um, now that you've given us a great message, why don't you tell us where we can get more great messages? You can get them at uh, the Everyday Progressive Show on YouTube and Twitch. I do stream every every once in a while whenever I can, but mm -hmm. I try to put out like a short five or so minute video once a week, more or less, to where the channel is stays stays active. But again, it's the uh, Everyday Progressive Show. My name is Joe, and I hope to see y'all there. And um, you know, it just it lets us grow this left wing movement together and do what we can to get the messages out there because. Um, I think that that's the only way we're going to do it. People got to know about these ideas, and hopefully this is my meager effort to help to make that happen. No, oh, absolutely. Thank you again for coming on, talking about co-determination. Oh, no problem, man. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Of course. And to anyone who's interested in following, I have sent his link in the chat. Thanks again for coming on. Yay. See ya. Folks, that was a pleasant little discussion, now wasn't it? Don't we all just love a pleasant little discussion about, about, uh, about moderate demands which can lead us more close to socialism? Don't we all love those moderate demands? Don't we all just love these intermediate demands that can get us one step towards worker power? That was nice and that was cute. I agree, TLJ620. What a cute conversation. What a valid conversation. Um, oh. The one thing that I didn't mention in that pol in that discussion that I wish I had mentioned is um, in the Doob article, which I linked in chat, one of the things that it specifically talks about is um, wage boards, which are akin to, um, how do I make this analogy? So if, if co-determination is for individual firms, um, then wage boards are for every firm. So the analogy is between like like individual firm unions and sectoral bargaining. So um, co-determination is to an individual firm what a wage board is to like the entire economy or to a given sector. Uh, basically, it's sort of a sectoral bargain which lets you set wages in given sectors akin to sectoral bargaining, uh, but it's done through a more legislative approach than a union approach, uh, which is really interesting. And we actually have a history of doing so in the United States. Um, and if you want to read more about it, you can read it on the EconFIP uh, link that I just sent. Vaporwave Doge, how do I book you to come on this show? Oh, depends on how much money you give, I guess. Squeal more, little pay pig. <laughs>